Okay, so, interesting here. I, uh, I just think it's way cool that, uh, what Art shared because you'll see that in a minute when you, when you see what I'm talking about today. I've been talking about spiritual warfare and I've been talking, and so I just know that this year is filled with a lot of opportunities, opportunities for growth, but opportunities are often also labeled challenges, right? Because every challenge is an opportunity. If we're more than victors through Christ, you know, if we're more than conquerors through Christ, then that means that when that challenge does come, we win. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yes. Uh, clarification, if we're, if we're in line with the Word of God and, and listening to the Holy Spirit and doing what He says, because I don't always win all my battles because I'm not listening very well sometimes, right? So there is some clarifications there, but again, if, if you go through a battle and you win, you're stronger through that, you've learned through that, right? It's all about that, and that's what life is all about. So, so every challenge is an opportunity, and I believe that um, we have some real victories coming. I really do believe that. Yep. I just know the, the Spirit of God is really stirring inside of me to, um, to be instant, in season and out of season, right? I was, at, uh, I was out about running errands a couple of days ago, and uh, there was a gentleman at Walmart, and I asked him, he was my checker, I asked him something I could pray for him for, and he, he almost broke down. He almost broke down, and he says, please pray for me that I overcome my flesh. That I overcome my flesh. He says, I'm, I'm, I, I know I'm living too much of a sinful life and I know that things need to change in my life. Please be praying for me for, for that. And I told him I would, and I'm gonna keep an eye on him. I'll go back again and check on him, right? But um, I thought that was really interesting because that's also what I'm talking about today, you know? And, um, and then I, from there I went over to Costco and I'm going up and down the aisles and everything, and, and there's just one guy coming the other way, and he looked a little familiar to me. I thought maybe I, maybe I had worked with him at, at uh, Boeing, and, and so I, I asked him, did you ever work at Boeing? He said, no, but we ended up talking for at least an hour. You could tell that he wanted somebody to talk to. You know what I'm saying? You could tell there was a need there for fellowship, you know, and so I didn't cut it off and leave. I just you know, allowed that to happen. And got his phone number, so I'm going to follow up with that. You know, um, uh, him and his wife live in here in Lacey. You know, so yeah. Uh, what I'm trying to get at is there's so much need out there. Yeah. There's so much need out there, and we're the answer to that. Amen. Right. We really are. And so there's I just. But again, it's all about opportunities and challenges. You have to get out there and do it, amen? And we have an enemy that we're fighting, and that's why I'm talking about spiritual warfare, because as we go out and do that, believe me, the enemy doesn't want that to happen, right? Absolutely. And that's why at the beginning of the year I talked about, um, I, I gave out several principles towards success in, in 24. The series is called Get Ready for 20, 2024. It's on, it's on our website. You can go there and watch the whole series if you want. Uh, but it's to equip you. Equip you for what? Spiritual warfare. Amen. Spiritual warfare. Because I believe God's calling his people to really get out there into the fields, yes. right? Jesus said, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers to the field. Well, guess what? The Lord of the harvest is trying to send laborers to the field. That's more of what Art and Johanna both were talking about here, right? Absolutely. So I gave you four things, four, four areas that we do spiritual warfare in, and we've been trying to go through those. The first one is the mind. That's the biggie. You have a spiritual warfare going on in your mind, whether you realize it or not. Amen. Because everything that happens in your life goes through this thing right here. Yes. Everything you say, everything you do starts up here with a thought. It all starts with a thought. So your mind is a battlefield. Then you have a battlefield of your flesh. That's another battlefield. That's what I'm gonna be talking about today. Then we have a battlefield of our surroundings. There's a spiritual warfare going on in America today for our, in our society, for the morality of our society. There's so much coming against it with all this wokeness and all that that's going on in, the, in, our, in, in our, not just in our nation, of course, but in the whole world, but of course we're focused in our nation. There's so much going on there. That's, that's a spiritual warfare, whether you believe it or not. There's, there's spiritual forces in play in what's going on in our nation. Yes. It's not just people, it's not. It, no, it's not. It, it's spiritual forces behind those people 
causing them and leading them and guiding them into all the things that they're doing and promoting. And then, of course, there's spiritual warfare in the heavenlies. And that if you, I can't get into all that right now, but Rick Renner does a fantastic series on this. But he talks about how the, uh, when I talked about the forces behind our society and what's going on there, well, there's also forces that are higher up than that because Satan has a hierarchy in his, in his, he has a governmental structure, he really does. And so there's, you know, uh, captains and generals and all that in his army. And so the heavenlies are the ones that are up high overlooking a, like maybe a whole nation or even a whole state. Yeah, they have, he has demonic forces assigned to Washington State, to Thurston County, to, you know, Lewis County, all the different counties, all the way up. He does, including, of course, our government, uh, our national government. So I started with the battlefield of mind. I want to read a scripture to you that I've shared with you before. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So we see that, that we walk in the flesh. So he's, we're recognizing that, yes, we have this flesh that we're operating in, right? Uh, if you, and, 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 but then also, we're not to war after the physical. So when I talk about the flesh later, I'm not talking about your body itself. I'm talking about the force behind it, which I'll explain all that later, okay? But, but he says that there's a warfare going on in our mind. And we have to be aware of, you have to, this is important, I know I've shared this with you before, you really honestly do have to stop just going through your life all the time and just responding and just going from one minute to the next, to the next, to the next. You have to stop and, here you go, think about what you think about. If you've never sat down, get away from everyone else, just down and think, what do I think about a lot? What's on my mind a lot? You know? What's the topic of my discussion every time I get together with people? Is it the same thing all the time? That'll tell you where you're at, right? So you gotta think about what you think about because those thoughts are the, th are, it's, it's the it's your, your thoughts are the very first step in your destiny. What you think goes through everything else and gets to you where you're going. It starts with a thought, okay? So it's really, don't you think then it would be really important to think about what you think about? Because see, if that first stop step in a direction I'm going is a thought, well then that means I've already headed in this direction. But if my thought is over this way, then I went, so now all of a sudden, two different directions, two different outcomes in life. So yeah, that first thought is massively important. You have to think about what you think about, okay? And that's why there's such a battle that goes on in your mind, okay? And that last scripture there, verse 6, I know I've shared this before, I want to say it again, because it always puzzled me for a long time, long time till I searched it all out. But in being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled, that disobedience means careless listening. It doesn't mean the act, action of disobeying the word of God. It means careless listening that leads to your disobedience. Okay? Now some of you might be zoning out on me right now. Then that's what you're talking, that's what we're talking about here. See what I'm saying? Or, or when you're reading the Bible, you, you, read three, two, th you read through three chapters and you stop and say, what did I just read? I've done that lots of times, believe me, because I'm a fast reader. And I was, wait a minute, did you really pay attention to what that scripture said? And so I go back and I slowly read it again and look at each scripture slowly and think about it and contemplate them, see? Otherwise, you're careless listening, okay? So that's what that's talking about. So our thought life is a battlefield. Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. How you think, that's how you are. Yeah. Believe me. Yeah. Okay? Isaiah 55, 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Our minds have to go through a process of renewal yep. to experience the plan that God has for us. And if his thoughts are higher than my thoughts, wouldn't it be a really good thing if I could capture his thoughts and go by those instead of my own? Amen. Amen? Absolutely. We need to think and learn to think how he thinks. 
And you're not going to do that if you don't stop to think about what you think about. And you know where I got that from? I was just sitting one day, and all of a sudden the Lord told me, you need to think about what you think about. That was a long time ago, so uh, I had a lot to deal with then, you know? So anyway, and then I, I went through, and I'm still doing a little recapping here because we missed a Sunday, and I want to remind you of things. So then I did, I, I talked about foundational thoughts. These are thoughts that I use to govern my life that, that helps me, they're a foundation for me, so whatever comes into my life, whether it's good or bad, these are the, this is the value system that I go to. If, if I'm going through a crisis in life, I'm going to go right back to this. If there's something bad happening in my life, whatever that is, I'm going to go back to this. What is it? I can do whatever I need in life through Christ. No matter what's happening to me, I can handle this. I can go through this because Christ is with me. Number two, God loves me unconditionally. I am not going to doubt his good will toward me. I'm not going to. I know God loves me unconditionally. I don't care if I just did something wrong. He loves me unconditionally. Unconditionally. God meets all my needs abundantly. See, these are the things you could... When a crisis hits, if you've planted this inside of you, then you're ready. But if you think you're going to you know, get a copy of this and then once it hits, then lift it up and go for it, a little late. A little late. I'm just talking to you guys, playing, okay? When my first wife died, I wasn't anywhere near this. I fell apart like a cheap watch. Like a cheap watch. I was good for nothing. I wasn't good for her. I was nowhere anywhere near where I could help her. Right? Fell apart like a cheap watch. I reached into my pocket for faith and there wasn't anything in there. See? And I'm here to tell you, life will throw crisis at you. Sooner or later, life is going to throw a crisis at you. It is. And I'm, I'm, I don't mean to be morbid or anything like that. Say you're married. Sooner or later, one of you is going to die before the other one, usually, right? You think, but we don't want to think about those things, right? We don't want to think about those things because they're too unsettling for us. But you know, I don't, I, I don't want my life like this. I'm just talking about me personally. I don't like my life like that. I want to be prepared for whatever comes my way rather than waiting. So I can't, I can't ignore things that, 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 are, um, that are bound to happen sooner or later. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so you have to. You have to build these things into you now. So when something happens, you have these already at your hand, okay? Otherwise, it's too late. So, Okay. Um, number four, I trust God completely. There's no need to worry. Number five, I will not live in fear. I will not live in fear. There's a lot of stuff going on in the world. I hear all this stuff coming at me all the time. Oh, this is happening. Oh, this is happening. Oh, this is happening. But I will not live in fear. What can, what can, they, do? What can they do to me? What can anybody do to me? If they kill me, hey, I'm with Jesus. I don't care. I really don't. Oh, you know, there's, there's different things going on, and people think, well, you could end up in jail if you preach the wrong thing. If I end up in jail, then I'm going to preach there. They can't shut me up. They couldn't shut up the disciples. They, they can't shut me up. The only way they can shut me up is to kill me. Hey, I win. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, seriously, so, so why, why fear? No. Number six, I'm content and emotionally stable. I don't get that way till I get all these. When I build these into me, now I'm emotionally stable. I'm ready to handle anything. I'm not going to fall apart like a cheap watch like I did before. Because when that happened to me and I overcame it, I was determined that that would never happen to me again. I will never fall apart like a cheap watch like that again, ever, no matter what happens. Amen. I am disciplined and self-controlled. I had to build these into me by doing that. You have to be disciplined at this. You know, oftentimes people will come to me and say that they're going through something with a health issue or something like that, and I give them a, I give them a prescription, and my kids know it already. I tell them, you need to take Psalms 103, verses 1 through 5, print them out on a card, and read them to yourself every night 10, 15 times before you go to sleep. There you go. I wrote you out a prescription. Those online, there's your prescription. Why? He says he heals all my diseases. I don't even have to worry. The doctors don't know what I have. It doesn't matter. Jesus doesn't. He said he healed it. Done. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, and, and then, but... but you know, uh, you have to have faith to do that. No, you do this and you get faith. Right. You do this. 
It starts with a thought. Everything starts with a thought. So just read the, the darn card, man. Read it, okay? You'll get faith. It will build in you. Faith comes from reading the Word of God. You don't have to have faith and then read the Word of God. Oh, I need faith before I can read the Bible. No, it's the other way around. Okay, so, so do it, okay? It just frustrates me because I see people hurting and I tell them that and then I ask them later, are you doing that? No. Okay, it's like if the doctor gives you this medicine, are you taking it? No. Well then, duh, right? Okay, I know, I'm getting on rabbit trails here, okay? I haven't even got into my message yet. I'm just doing recap, okay, but, but, but you gotta get this, guys, you really do. These are things that I've learned in my life. I didn't get this from some you know, some sermon online or something like that. No, this is something I just went back, okay, okay, God, what are the foundational things that you've taught me over the years? And this is what he's taught me, okay? I am called by God and empowered to do his will. When we became pastors, I felt like I was a fish that had been out of its water all of its life and was suddenly put into water. This is where I'm supposed to be. This is what I'm supposed to do. This is who I am. I'm a pastor, amen? And so I know that I'm called by God. And if he called me and put me in a position, then that means he's empowered me to do it. Could you imagine a God that would put you in a position and then withhold everything you need to do it? Yeah. God, that'd be crazy, right? Absolutely. And then the, the ninth one, I love people and enjoy helping them. Because anything God calls you to do, that's what it's going to be right there. Loving people and helping them in some way or another. Amen? So those are the foundational thoughts that I taught you. Now I want to continue with the next area of the spiritual battle, which is your flesh, right? Which concerns sin, which is what Art was talking about. I'm sitting there going, whoa, dude, man, it's exactly what my message is about. And here, Art, who hasn't shared a word in I don't know how long, but God suddenly puts it on his heart to get up and talk to us, and it's about exactly the same thing that's in this, in this message. You know what that tells you? Evidently, there's something in this message today. You're here for a reason. He even told you that. You're here today for a reason. This is for you. And he wanted it so bad to get into your head that he, he spoke to Art to confirm it before I shared it. Okay? So I want to remind you of a saying that I've taught you before, and that's this. Watch your saying, watch your thoughts. I put it up there. Watch your thoughts, for they become words. Like I said, it all starts with your thoughts. It really does. Watch your thoughts, for they become words. Watch your words for they become actions. Watch your actions, for they become habits. Watch your habits, for they become your character. Watch your character, because it becomes your destiny. It really does. And that's a process, it really is, it's a process. Your thoughts eventually become your actions, and then if you keep entertaining them, they become a habit. And then if you continue with that habit, it becomes a part of your character. It becomes part of who you are, okay? Yeah. Before that, it's not really a part of who you are. It's just something you're doing. But when it becomes a habit, it becomes part of your character, okay? All right? And then your character will affect everything, ultimately your destiny. It really will. Because your character, if God's called you to something, your character will either support that or sabotage it. It will. It'll do one or the other, all right? So, all right. Um, this, this, if you look at this process here, this is a really good example of how a person loses their salvation. People say, can you lose your salvation? I believe you can lose your salvation. I don't think you lose your salvation over, over a sin. I think losing your salvation is a process that takes years in a person's life. If you've been saved, honestly really saved, I believe that you can go down a process to where you deny God in your life completely, but that's a long process. I don't think that's something that, oh my gosh, I sinned today, so therefore I lost my salvation, I better go get saved again. I don't know, I'm not saying that at all. But I do believe that it's possible for a person to have lost their salvation. But that's a long process down the road, okay? and many opportunities for God to keep trying to tug you back toward himself, okay? But, but it starts with your thoughts and actions, habits, character, until you've changed everything about you. You've been affected so bad. And I don't think that happens very often either. I really don't. I really don't think that happens very often. I'm just telling you, I do believe that the possibility is there. 
okay? You may not agree with me, and well, that's okay. I guess we'll find out when we get to heaven, right? But so anyway, um, but it also is a process of what goes on in your flesh. And we're going to see that more as we go through. As a matter of fact, here's a, here's a biblical saying that actually um, is a version of that. James 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. So here he gives a process. You ready? For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot tempt, be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Here you go, here's the process. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away from his own desires. Where do your desires start at? Yeah. Right up here, yeah. right up here, right? But then you're drawn away, what? That means you're going into actions. Now you're going into becoming like more of your character. Your own desires are enticed. And then when the desire has conceived, that's action. I thought about it, I thought about it, you know, um, you know oh yeah, my gosh, it's a habitual thought, and all of a sudden, King David, he's looking at this gal across the way there, taking a bath, and he starts thinking, and he's more thinking, he's more thinking, until finally what happened, then he ends up killing her husband and committing adultery, right? But it started with a thought when he first saw her, absolutely. And besides, I, you know what, I don't really need to teach you this, do I? Because you probably know all about this, don't you? Come on, we all do. In one form or another, we've done something wrong in our life, none of us are perfect, and it all started with a thought in this process right here, absolutely. When the desire had conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. It's your destiny, right? So this scripture is exactly what that saying was. It really honestly is, okay? So there's a direct connection between the battle in your mind and the battle of your flesh. There's a direct connection between the two, all right? Matter of fact, if, if you can win the battle of your mind, it will take a lot of the battle away from your flesh. It really will, because you'll stop those thoughts before they ever go any further. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So, um, you notice, um, I'm going to say it this way, because I wrote it down. I want you to get it the way I said it. If you can win the battle of your mind concerning a certain subject, then you can win the battle of your flesh concerning that same subject. Now, I want you to notice what I said, a certain subject, because you can be overcoming in one area and not overcoming in another area. So, it's not like, oh, I've overcome sin. Which one? See what I'm saying? Because... You can be an overcomer in one area, not in another, right? So remember that. There's always a direct connection between your mind and your flesh. So I want to ask you a question before we go any further. How many of you, raise your hand, how many of you have ever acted against your nature? Look and see if anybody didn't. I'm going to refer to this question later and then show you something about it, okay? That's why I asked that question now. When we get further down into this, you'll see later in the message, okay? So, another thing I want you to remember, when Jesus was in the wilderness, think about this, when Jesus was in the wilderness and he was being tempted, right? Did you notice something? Satan did not tempt him with a cigarette. And I'm not preaching cigarettes, believe me, I don't even care if you smoke or don't smoke, that has nothing to do with your salvation. All, what I'm getting at is, is he didn't tempt him with a cigarette, though, did he? No. He didn't tempt him with adultery. He didn't tempt him with things like that, right? He tempted Jesus with something that he wanted. He just fasted for 40 days. What was the first temptation? Why don't you turn these stones into bread? He tempted him with something that he wanted, okay? Food. Then he tempted Jesus with trying to, uh, to get Jesus to doubt the help of angels. To doubt the help of angels. Why don't you jump off of here? The angels will protect you because they, you know, keep you from stumbling your foot against a stone. You know, he quotes that scripture, right? And Jesus denied that opportunity also. How was that a temptation? After this is all done, angels came and ministered to him. So he was looking forward to the ministers at the end of this coming in and ministering to him. So that's why that second temptation happened there. He's the ten, tempting him for something that he wanted, right? And then the third temptation comes, right? 
The third temptation is he takes him up to a pinnacle and he says, look over the kingdoms of the earth. He says, if you'll bow down and worship me, then I'll return my authority over that's been given to me. He says, I can do whatever I want with it. At that moment, if Jesus would have bowed down, Satan would have given him the authority over the, all the earth, right? Over all the earth. You know what would have happened then? It would have ended all suffering, all human suffering in the earth, which Jesus wants to do. He wants, he doesn't want to see people hurting. He would have, it would, because he would have taken over. He would have caused healing for everybody. He would have, everything great, right? The only problem is, is that they still would have all been in their sin which means eventually when they did die, they'd go to hell. Right. See, that he didn't come here to save you from your suffering. I'm sorry to tell you that, he didn't. He came here to save you from your sin, right? right? So that you can go to heaven. The, the end result is heaven, not here. So whatever happens here, you know, we want things to be good, but they're not always good, right? So what did he, he tempted him again with what he wanted. He wanted to help the human race, see? So therein lies the power of sin. What do you want? Right. What do you want? It's what you want. Therein lies the battle of the flesh. Your flesh has a voice and it says, I want this. I want this. Look, let's look at this some more. The battle of the flesh. The best place I can think of, and I have a lot here. I'm not, I know I'm not going to go through it all. I'll cut it off some point and, and take the continuation next time. But... But the best place to look for the subject of the battle of the flesh is the Apostle Paul's teaching in Romans chapter 7. He lays it all out there big time, right? So we're going to go through chapter 7 of Romans here, starting with verse 1. Romans 7, 1. Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? Now just bear with what this. He's giving you an analogy here, though. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. Well, that makes sense. But if the husband dies, she's released from the law of her husband. That also makes sense, right? So far, so good. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's free from that law so that she is no longer an adulteress, although she marries another man. So once she's dead, or he's dead, the marriage is broken. The connection is broken between the two. All right? Verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law, okay, through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another. To who? To him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear the fruit, bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were arose by the law, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we've been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should, know, uh, should serve the newness of the Spirit and not of the oldness of the law. So let me stop there for a second. What is he saying there? He's saying that when you came to Christ, you were killed. Baptism is, is an example of what happened to you when you gave your life to Christ. Right? You go under the water. It says you baptize unto his death. Why? you got to die. You have to die so that you're no longer married to that old sin nature, to, to Satan's rule. That has to happen. It has to be a death of a, of a connection. So once you're dead, now you can be remarried to Christ. Years ago, the Lord gave me a vision. I've shared it with you before, but in this vision, I saw, I was standing at the cross, and Jesus was on the cross. You could see him up there. And as I was watching him, he started to become transparent. And as, he, as his body became transparent, you could see a body of another person on the inside of him. And it became more and more transparent and disappearing, and the body inside of him became more and more apparent. Until this transformation took place, and this body that was on the cross was me. Right. I saw myself on the cross, crucified. Right. And then... I be started to become transparent, and the body inside of me began to form until it reformed back, and it was Christ on the, on the cross again. And I had just, we had just, we had a, this is the time period where we had a, a Ford Aerostar and a, some minivan, and we sold it. Oh, no, no, we had just paid it off. I'm sorry, we hadn't sold it yet. We had just paid it off. 
All the payments are done, no more payments, right? And after this transformation and this vision I saw, the Lord spoke to me and said, what would you do if the company, the finance company called you up and said you owe another payment? And I said, Lord, I'd tell them, no, that's paid off. I'm not paying any more payments. That's paid off. It's paid off. See, I don't have to pay for my sins. I paid for them already. I died for my sins. I, cru I was crucified for my sins. Once you've, once you've killed me, you can't kill me again, right. right? I paid the price for my sins. No, wait a minute, no, Christ paid, but yet I paid. No, no, well, actually, Christ was crucified. No, well, well, I was crucified. The Bible says I was crucified with him, right? right. What is it trying to get to your, through your head? Is that, like Art was saying, the price was paid, it's done, over with, end of story. You work, it's just as if you were hanging on that cross yourself. And if you were hung on that cross and that was the ultimate payment for your sin, and then Satan comes up or anyone else comes up and says, you need to pay for that sin, what are you going to say? The same thing I said about that stupid van. No, I'm not paying into the price for that. What does that mean? I don't have to earn God's love. I don't have to, I don't have to worry about whether God's going to take care of me. I don't have to worry about anything between me and God, why? Because it's paid for. Yeah. And when he looks at me, he sees Christ crucified. Amen? Amen. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't have to worry about any of that anymore. That's what this is talking about here. I, you know, I'm dead. I was on the cross. I'm dead. Satan has no more hold. What did Jesus say? Satan comes and he has nothing in me. Right. Guess what? Satan comes to Mike Burkhart. He has nothing in me. There's nothing he can grab a hold of. Why? Because I'm dead. You want a dead body, that's what you got, buddy. You got a dead body here, you know? Okay, you getting this? Okay, let's go on. I don't know where I left off. Um, oh, oh, verse, let's go with verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by. We were held by that, okay? So that when we would serve, so that, uh, that we should serve in newness of the spirit and not in oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. I had to be taught what was right and wrong, okay? For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Right? But sin, taking the opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire, for apart from the law, sin was dead. Apart from the law, sin was dead. Apart from the law, sin was dead. You're dead. You're dead. You're apart from the law. It doesn't mean, you know, oh, I can go about break the law now because I'm apart from it. That's not what it's saying. That's saying that, that all the things that, that, that you've done in life, were, you, you were crucified. You're dead now. You're apart from that. Okay? Let's go on. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Now, he says I was alive once without the law. What he's talking about there is when he, before the age of accountability, when he was a young person, he didn't know any better. And that, the age, of, everybody wants to know what's, what's the age of accountability. It's different with every person. It's different. It's, it's when you've come to the knowledge of, 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 uh, of God and, uh, and not of necessarily of God, but of, of knowledge of, of, of a, a destiny in your life, a knowledge of developing a, 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 a value system in your life, all of that. And I can't identify it completely either because it's, I don't understand it all myself. But there is a certain point in time where, where it's acknowledged that you have the ability to make a decision for your destiny. Does that make sense? So whatever age that is, and I believe that's what different with every per, uh, child matures differently. Okay, but that's what he's saying there. He says, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin, in other words, when he started getting taught and understanding, then, then now he was accountable for it. And when that happened, sin, that was, now it's labeled sin. And then he died, right? 
and the commandment which was to bring life I found to bring death. Because if you could keep all the commandments, then you're, you, you're, you're alive. You're spiritually alive and you get to go to heaven. Unfortunately, nobody made it. Nobody made it, right? Um, for sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, again, like it's all about teaching. You know, the Bible says that the law was a teacher, okay, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. So in other words, so that you can become completely aware of what is right and what is wrong, what is holy, what God requires to be able to be in his presence, everything about God, all of it, it's all under that. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. He was sold under sin. Okay, and there's certain terms that I keep repeating because I want you again, I'll tie it together pretty soon here. For what am I doing? I do, for, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will do, that I do not practice, but what I hate, that I do. I probably don't need to explain any of that to you guys either, do I? Oh, there's things I know I should be doing, gosh, and I'm not doing them. And there's things I'm doing, I shouldn't be doing that. Even the Apostle Paul admitted that he struggled with his flesh and with sin. Absolutely. Okay? If then I do what I will, will, uh, will not to do, in other words, he's willing, his will says I don't want to do this. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree that the law that it is good. Now, now you remember when I asked you a few minutes ago if you've ever done anything against your nature? Remember that? Yeah. What is Paul talking about here? When you got saved, you took on the nature of Christ. See, you took on the nature of Christ. And so, in your spirit, your, your mind didn't get it. It has to be renewed. But your spirit got it. And in that process of renewing your mind, the areas that are not mature will cause you to act against the nature of Christ in you. I'm going to say that again, and that's what Paul is describing here. In that process of renewing your mind, growing spiritually, getting more of being more of a mature Christian, in that process of renewing your mind, the areas that are not mature will cause you to act against the nature of Christ that's in you. See, in other words, you had the nature of the enemy, you got born again, and now you have the nature of Christ on the inside of you. Have you ever acted against your nature? You know, every one of you raised your hand. If you're a Christian, what you're saying is, I have acted against the nature that's Christ, of Christ in me. Does that make sense? And that's what Paul was saying he did too. All right? So in other words, we have a battle of the flesh. It's big. Absolutely. Absolutely it's big. Okay? So let me go on. Verse 17. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. When he says I, he's speaking from his spirit, not his mind and not his body. Okay? Because he's separating himself out, realizing there's a struggle that goes on on the inside of him. Okay? And he's going to identify that more. So it's no longer I that do it. So he's saying, and my, his, my spirit's saying, that's not me, because I have the nature of Christ. That's not me doing it. That's the other part of this threefold person I'm part of here. Okay? For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, not the spirit. You can tell how he's separating himself there. He's talking not in me, but in my, right? In my flesh, nothing good dwells, for to will is present with me. In other words, I, I want to do certain things. I want to do what's right. But how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will do, I do not do. But the evil that I do not want to do, or don't do, or shouldn't do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will, see how it's a tongue twister? And uh, other people like the different translations. I should probably read a different translation to you, but I stuck with the New King James. Now, if I do what I will will not to do, or what I don't, you know, what I really want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. I find then a law that evil is present with me. And then he goes on to say, the one who wills to do good. 
two, 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 two separate things. In other words, I re- I, here's what he's saying here. I'm going to break it down for you. I find a law that evil is in my flesh, but in my spirit it wills to do good. See? For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, my spirit, but I see another law in my members, stupid flesh, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members, meaning his flesh, his will, his, his, his wants. Remember, that's what it is. It's your wants. Okay? You, you will never be tempted with something you don't want. Okay? So you should start identifying what it is you want. Right? So I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my minds. We had to slow this down because it's a tongue twister. I want to make sure to get what it's saying here. Bringing into captivity of the law of sin, which is in my members. And then he, he, he exclaims his frustration as he's writing this. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? It's like his spirit's going, how do I get rid of this thing? How do I stop this stupid flesh of making wrong decisions and, and not doing what God wants me to do? How do I get out of this this vicious circle I'm in all the time. I thank God through Jesus Christ my Lord. That's how. I thank God through Jesus Christ my Lord. So then, I recognize I'm in my flesh. I'm still growing. With my mind, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin. If you could stop your body, your flesh, from sinning, then you could go to heaven like, uh, you know, Jesus did and still have the same body, which I don't want anyway. (laughs) Right? So when you go, you're going to leave this flesh behind to do what it deserves to do, and that's rot. But your spirit, your soul, your mind's going to go to heaven. Mm -hmm. Amen? That's what he's talking about here. So the law of his flesh wars against the law of his mind. What this is referring to is even though he has intellectually decided he wants to obey God, his flesh wars against the desire to serve God. But you've got to remember something. After this whole chapter, which can be really depressing... After this whole chapter 7 of Romans, we get Romans chapter 8. Thank God. Amen? What can separate me from the love of God? What can separate me from the love of God? Nothing. Nothing. All of that battle in my flesh, all of the things I've done in the past, all of that garbage that's in my life right now, all the strife, all the confusion, all the the hurt, the anger, whatever it is we're dealing with in life, he says, even that all of that is a part of the flesh. You think about some of the stuff that you were probably all wanked out about 10 years ago, you can't even remember what it was. Right? Absolutely not. And when I get to heaven, I just know this, that, and I, you've heard my testimonies, I'm not going to go into that, but I know what it feels like to be in heaven. And when you get there, the peace that hits you, nothing matters anymore, ever. Nothing matters. You know every, everything is okay. Everything's, gonna be, everything's okay. Everything is, and you don't have to clarify it any further than that. Everything's okay. Forever. Everything's happy and, and, and everything's okay forever. Forever. See? Why? And because, see, I've left all of that dead. It's all gone. And you get to experience what Paul was talking about here forever. Amen? Amen? Amen. Galatians 5.17 says this, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not the things that you wish. There is a fight that goes on, but we win. We win. Because in the end, the flesh dies. Amen? And yeah, you might battle things the rest of your life. 
There might be things in your life that you, you're, never, you're never able to, to, to get that monkey off your, off your back, maybe. I hope not. There might be things you struggle with, you know, certain things, uh, wants in your life that are not godly. But sooner or later, when you, when you, when you die and go to heaven, that'll all be washed away. Amen? It'll all be washed away. Amen? Did you get something from this? We'll stop here. I have more on the subject of the flesh, of course, because um, there's a lot that we have to deal with with our flesh. Amen? But uh, I'm going to stop there for the sake of time, and we'll take the rest of this up next time. Amen? Go ahead and stand up, guys. Is this, was this okay? Did you get something from this? Okay. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I... I had an example, but I'm not going to give it, <laughs> because I, I've done this example with people one-on-one, -on -one, but I'm not going to do it in a congregational setting, but I'll use something different maybe. But um, suffice to say, when you develop your value system, and you need to develop it, not allow it to just happen. There's too many people that, that they, they, they go through life based on, we all have a value system. So they're based on their value system. And so if you say, hey, how come you did this? Well, that's just who I am. As if the way they are dictates their life and they have no options to try to change it. You can develop your character. You can decide, you know what? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm easily angered, or I'm easily depressed, or I'm easily uh, self-conscious around people. I'm easily too shy. I can't break out of my shell. Whatever that is, you can decide to change that about yourself. Come on, you can. You can decide to change the things that, that you know you need to change in life. You can make that decision. Okay? My first wife, Gail, I was a jerk. I was a jerk, and I'm using the nice words. I was a jerk. The last six months of our marriage were the best six months of our, I forget how long we were married, I don't know, I think five years, something like that. But before that, because we'd went to the counseling and things were getting a whole lot better before she died. I thank God for that six months, but before that, and even in the middle of that, I was a jerk. I was a jerk. There's a lot worse words, guys. Use the ones you know, because that's exactly how I was. And when she died, it was too late. It was too late to change me. It was too late to go back and change and take back. I would have taken, because here's the thing, whenever we got in an argument, if it was her fault, it was her fault. If it was my fault, it was because something she did made me do that. Oh, come on, you all use that example probably yourself. I'm being open with you guys here, okay? Um, I said things that I wish I could take back. I did things I wish I could take back. I did not value my wife like I should have valued her. And I wish... And I remember when she died, I'm in my pastor's office, sobbing on his desk, saying, I just wish I knew that she would forgive me. Yeah. And I looked at myself in the mirror, and I was absolutely, totally disgusted. And I said, that man has to die. That man has to die. And I killed him. I killed him. And you know how I killed him? Instantly. I, was, I didn't have to go through the process I'm trying to teach you. I didn't have to do that. You know why? Because I, I took the harsh, hard way and decided I, that guy had to die. And he died. He died right then on the spot. 
I am a thousand times better husband to Johanna I ever was to my first wife because I changed my character. I could change, but I had to go through hell to change. You don't have to. You can change whatever about you needs to change simply by making that decision. I'm going to look at myself and say, that needs to change, and I'm going to do it. Because if you do, then your thoughts will change, your actions will change, your habits will change. And that's why I could stand up a few months later, Pastor Jan asked me to give a testimony, and I told him about my first wife, and I said, that will never, ever happen again. Why? Because that old man is dead, and I'm full of faith now. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm living in Romans chapter 8 because I went through a rough part of chapter 7 the worst way. You don't want to go through it that way. Guys, you're married. Honor your wife. Believe me. Because there come a day someday where you might lose her and then it's going to be too late to tell her all the things you wish you would have told her beforehand. I'm sorry I got into all this, but it's all about character change and I'm just telling you my, my example. I had to do it the hard way. You don't have to. Amen? Amen. Amen? Praise God. So I hope you don't mind me sharing that. I don't mean to bring everybody down, but, you know, that's what it's about. It's about teaching you so that you can be successful in life. Amen? Amen. Praise God. And you know what? God uses the things we go through in life to help others. That's what it's all about. Right. Johanna's story has helped so many women. She sits and talks to women for three or four hours at a time. I have no idea what they talk about. I can't talk that long. But she does. But you know what she does most of the time? I really can, honestly, except when I'm preaching, maybe. But, but she's, she's mostly listening. But that's her, right? Amen. That's the gift she has. But, but God wants to use you, but he needs to get past you. I want to say that again. He wants to use you, but he has to get past you. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Okay. I'll stop there. Hallelujah. Does anybody need prayer? Probably everybody needs prayer for de depression, 